It's a pretty big amount for miscellaneous. We're having sound issues, just so you know what I'm, I'm just hanging out down here. Okay. I left a balance then of $294,910, majority held in the WISC investment account, and then the rest held in the bank. The debt service funds 3839 There was $7,450 in interest, and left them a balance of $1,679,323 of that to the WISC investment account. Going to fund 40 their capital expansion fund at $88 in interest. And we had them $160,061. All of that is held in the WISC investment account. Fund 46 capital improvement trust fund at $1,133 in interest. We have a majority of that again held in the WISC investment account, a small amount in the bank, leaving a balance of $3,596,039. 149 is our capital referendum fund at 106,756 in interest, expenditures in the amount of $1,403,912. Left a balance $29,222,804. This is all held in the WISC investment account. Fund 73, employee trust, we had $505 in interest, expenditures of 16,684, which left them a balance of $1,894,908. Majority of that then is held in the OPEB trust and a small amount is held in the bank. Questions on the individual funds? Okay. Concludes the financial report. Ken? I move that we accept the financial report and the payment requests in the amount of $2,304,948. We'll call vote, please. Hill? Yes. Uh, I'll second it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, second. Motion by Ken, second by Emily. Um, any other discussion, Mr. Board? Okay. Go ahead and do roll call. Hill? Yes. Trudell? Yes. Carter? Yes. Early? Yes. Palmer? Yes. Schindel? Yes. Garbrecht? Yes. Motion carried. Uh, reports and discussions. Uh, first up here, the oath of office of newly elected board members. Um, just to note that uh, Ginny O'Harrell, uh, she had notified me a while back that she was going to have an obligation. She was going to be out of town uh, for a, a kind of a work-related uh, uh, thing. And um, so we'll do her oath separately um, this week or whenever we're able to get it done. I think we have to have it done by when? What's the date again? Um, she's going to do it by the 20th. So okay, I think roughly the 20th we have to have it done by. So, so with that, I think uh, me and you, pal. Okay, so just repeat after me. I, your name. I, Clint Gardebrook. I, Brian Baumler. Having been elected or appointed to the Office of O'Connell School Board. Having been oh, I just together. Uh, what do you do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Having been elected or appointed to the Office of O'Connell Falls School Board. But have yet have not yet entered upon the duties thereof. But have not yet entered upon the duties thereof. Swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And I will faithfully discharge the duties of said office. And I, and I will safely discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. <laughs> <laughs> to the best of my ability. So help. Oh, you got. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Carrie, you and I didn't get notes last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I knew you could. <laughs>
any teaching. Correct. Okay. <laughs> um, district administrative report. So starting off with the month review, we had a chance to meet with uh, our representative from Neola regarding the update um, on our policies. And we also met with the members of the policy committee that they're going to be reviewing that with the full board later this evening. Uh, March 27th is part of our professional development day. We conducted crisis notification practice at both of our elementary schools. Notification practice helps us to validate areas where new technology is assisting us um, as we implement ways that we can improve during a crisis situation. Um, it's helped us also to identify we need to continue to focus in the future. I want to thank the district safety team for your planning to develop these district standard operating procedures. Also thank the technology services department helping us make our plan a reality. And then also thanking all the staff um, for their involvement and their willingness to practice this. Um, as a follow-up to the board's decision regarding managing our own food service, we're in the process. We've posted a food service position and we're starting to develop our transition plan. Uh, we met with uh, Taher during the course of um, this last month. And so now the next step is working together with food service staff as we develop our, our plan moving forward. Also, thank you to the staff members that have been involved in participating in hiring. Um, it's that time of year and schools are busy putting together hiring teams. It's time that folks have to plan um, being away from their classroom. And we greatly appreciate their, their participation because it makes the, the identification of the people who join our team more effective. And as a last thank you, um, wanted to reach out all the crews that were involved in restoring power in our area this past week. We greatly appreciate their efforts. Um, my wife and I were personally without power for five days. It gave us a better perspective of how lucky we are. Um, we take things for granted, such as heat in our home, electricity, flush toilets, um, not having to babysit a generator every three hours. So. We had folks that are internal to our area. We also had people that came from all over the state and even some out of state. So without their help, there's no doubt we would still be without power. So thank you very much. And then also, as was already stated tonight, Ken, thank you very much for your service to our school district. I think most people, um, it's hard to really understand what it is to be a board member, um, but to be a board member and invest 21 years is absolutely outstanding. So we appreciate it. Okay. All right. Next up, old business. Uh, we do not have a student representative report this week or this this uh, meeting. Uh, old business donations. We'd ask the board that you would consider accepting the donations, and also on behalf of school district, want to thank the donors. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support. I'll make a motion to accept uh, donations. I'll second. Motion by Chad, second by Gary. <laughs> Open it up for discussion. Just thank you to everyone. That's thank a lot of a lot of hard work. Yeah. Pretty pretty incredible when you look at the amount of donations over the course of the year mm -hmm. that we get. It's uh, pretty fantastic. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next up, the uh, capital referendum update. And Brent is here from Nexus, and he's going to start this off, and then Kim and I will kind of join in. Hi, Brent. Hi. Hello, everyone. Again. Thanks for having me back. Um, so just a few topics tonight. Um, wanted to discuss some uh, from some discussions from last meeting, kind of wrap that idea up. Um, have a short, quick budget update, and then uh, look at progress over at the job site across the street there. So um, when discussing change orders, we wanted to kind of to go back to the beginning a little bit of talking about when the process of hiring a contractor to do this project and how the board approached that process and, and what Nexus understood the direction to be from that process of when we got hired. Um, <clears throat> so I understand when Nexus got hired, there were different approaches that were considered. Um, a traditional general contractor architect approach, um, other traditional, more traditional general contractor approaches, and then there was the Nexus approach, which is more of a construction management owner's rep type, type of approach. Um, 
with the board um, choosing to hire Nexus, Nexus understood the direction from the board to basically take that more owner's rep approach that we proposed and be a steward of the district <coughs> to not only build a quality project on time and under budget, but really watch the district's money throughout the project to make sure that quality and money together, tied together, and both are washed seamlessly together. Um, Nexus's approach is a little bit different than a lot of contractors to where we actually do any of the work ourselves. We're more independent third party, watching over the budget and the project and the quality of the project. So we understood that to be a, a, a true, true want of the board of hiring Nexus. Um, the other big things that we understood was on time and on budget. Um, we heard that loud and clear that there's a set budget for this project, we have to make that budget. We saw that throughout the design process, a lot of, um, when Russ was here giving presentations during design, right, he was very concerned about we have to design to a budget, right? So that was, we heard that loud and clear. And um, so that's, you know, what we heard. And then build a quality project on time. The school has to open on time. There's no other, no other if, ands, or buts about it. The kids are showing up that day, so we have to be ready. So um, just wanted to remember what Nexus heard and what the, we believe the school board wanted out of the hiring of Nexus for this process. So one of the things that I thought about too that it always helps me is I use analogies. And one of the analogies is that if I'm going out to my house, I can choose to either interact with the realtor who's representing the seller, or I can hire my own realtor that I know is going to represent me as the buyer. Um, when you do that, you go into a contract with that realtor and by law, they're required then to represent me versus representing the seller. So when we hired Nexus as a school district, we did something similar in that we entered into a contract with them. And the thought process is we don't have the time, nor do we have the know-how to oversee that project on our own. And we wanted somebody that was going to work for the district. And the thought process is that some of the actions that they would take would outweigh the cost. And I think you're gonna see exactly what I'm talking about as we move into one of the next slides. Um, so with the direction that we heard from the district, we instituted our standard process, which is kind of what, what I'm calling the nexus way, right? So we started with a design process that produced, produced a design that can yield bids within a budget, right? We all know there's a fine, like I said, there's a fine out of money, we have to stay within that budget. So the design process shoots to hit within that budget. We acquire competitive bids on all the trade work. Like I said, we don't, as you know, we don't self-perform anything, so it's all um, equal opportunity competitiveness on all the trades throughout the entire project. We then also hold a contingency, so we get those bids that we saw that we all went through, we get those bids based off that original design, then we hold a contingency for future decisions, unforeseens, all items that could come up on a project, because on a complex, complex project the size of this building, we all know there's never, during the design process, no one's gonna think of every single thing. There's gonna be unforeseens, there's gonna be different things that come up during a project. There's hundreds of workers out there, there's dozens of trades out there, they all have to seamlessly come together. We try to draw a drawing that shows the work to the best of the ability and get those competitive bids to match the bid to the match the drawings as best as possible. But during the throughout of a project, there's going to be instances where no set of drawings is perfect. There's a million different ways to, to do things in a construction job site that our Nexus staff is out there making decisions on a daily basis to ensure the quality is what we expect, even if. Maybe the drawings didn't have it exactly right. Or maybe during the design process, I mean, during the design process, there's hundreds of hours between the district staff, the district you know, teachers, the, the end user groups that we call them, the tech ed staff, the kitchen staff, all these people spent hundreds of hours in design meetings trying to produce the best possible building they could. There's no way they're gonna think of everything. When you're out there walking around, we have, we've had staff come out to the job site ready and walk around and we've asked them questions. They might think, you know what? I've changed my mind. I just, I, now that I see the space, I want something different. Or maybe they've learned something different in the last six months since they had that design meeting. We want to take all those things into account 
throughout the process, not just say, nope, this was a decision that was made eight months ago and we have to stand with it. We want to we want to re make reiterate those questions and rehash those decisions when possible and when it makes sense within the budget to make sure we produce the best quality building. Um, so back to the way that budget-wise, kind of the way we do things is we hold a contingency for those different items. Then during construction, we review the design and review the final product to make sure we produce the highest quality building within it and for items that make sense, you know, just because you're under budget, we're not going to decide to do gold-plated doors. That doesn't make sense. But maybe it makes sense to add some elements, or maybe it makes sense to do some other things to get you the best quality budget, or the best quality building, now that we have a clearer picture of the budget after the bids. And then, obviously, the last thing is you got to complete the project on time and on budget. That's without, goes without saying. So looking at where the project is to date, um, Total change orders that have been approved on the whole project is $174,000. The contingency for this whole project started at $1.5 million. And you'll see this on a couple of slides later. We'll go through the numbers exactly what Kim and, Kim and I have gone through the numbers. But the entire referendum, the, the contingency started at $1.5 million. That was based off percentage of 5% percentage, of roughly 5% percentage that Nexus knows is a historical average of what we see on projects. Whether those changes come from design or from owner or from unforeseen in the field or or weather or whatever it is that's kind of the historical range that we know and we've been able to put projects in place that, that can meet that contingency not only our projects but industry-wide projects as well so what we're showing on the slide is the original contingency was 1.5 million through under bids coming in under budget that contingency went to 1.9 million. So the 174,000 has come off of that 1.9 million. So that's 8.8% of that whole contingency is what's been used so far out of that 174. In comparison, the 174 is 0.46% of the entire referendum budget. So when I say 5% of change orders, <coughs> we typically see 5% of that of the whole referendum budget. Right now, we're currently at 0.46%. So historical construction averages, we're doing extremely well by the fact that we're only at 0.46%. Also, the project is roughly 35% complete at this time. So um, an industry term we use is the burn rate, right? So we have this contingency, and we want to make sure <coughs> we burn the contingency slower than what the project goes through in in production, right? Whether it's through design or through bidding or through construction. So we're at 35% of the project complete and we're at 8% of the contingency burned. So in my opinion, we're doing well that we're ahead of making good decisions to use the contingency when it makes sense and when it's needed, but not get ahead of where we are throughout the actual in place of the work. So this is the sheet that Kim and I go through every month. Kim produces this sheet. So just to get into the little the details of the numbers, Kim and I, every change order and every month, we go through down to the detail, down to the penny, to make sure that my numbers and her numbers match up every month. Yes, so this uh, spreadsheet here reflects that. It's actually a summarized version of the spreadsheet that I keep, but it does tie back to what Brent has. So he's keeping a budget, and then I'm making sure that what he's giving us matches what I think it should be. So this is the summary of the approved contract and the bids over time. So everything that's on here has been approved by uh, you at the board at one point in time. If we start um, looking from left to right, the first column is the original approved bid and contract. So that is the amount that has been approved, 37.63 million. Then you can see the change orders that have been on the different types of bids. Uh, to get us back to the 37.63 million. So I'll kind of go through this. The top part in white, big groups one through eight, those uh, you have seen all the bids and approved those. We're working on those amounts there, then plus the change orders you've seen to date. The blue area there is budgeted at this point. This is the part of the project that is not set in stone. It is um, to go out to bid at some point or it's contingency. And you see the contingency line there, um, and Brent said it's started at 1.5 million, 
because we came under budget on big groups one through eight, it went up to 1.9 million. We used 174,000, leaving 1.8 million. The amounts below the blue is um, anything with a percentage in there that is the percentage agreement per the contract um, that we pay Nexus for <coughs> different types of services. And then the amounts that don't have percentages, I actually receive actual amounts or invoices related to each one of the spending within those areas. So everything is being monitored. I'm making sure that it matches where we're at the blues. It's 13.2% of the budget that hasn't been solidified at this point yet. Um, the contingencies was started at 5% of the total budget. And this does not include any of the interest that we're earning on the project at the time. So there's $2 million roughly in addition to this that isn't stated there. So, you know, we work with Nexus. We see the change orders along with other staff members that deem that it's a need or a want that we have being transparent with us. And that contingency amount is the districts to approve or deny as it is. So we're bringing that to you. I feel confident that our contingency is sufficient at this point you know, to hopefully keep us through the rest of the project. As you can see, it's we've only used 0.46% of, of our total budget at this time. So um, you board members have re uh, the contracts at this point, but everything in here that I've stated is comes directly from those contracts. And something important I want to point out on this budget is, so as Kim said, the top one through eight is the bids from the contractors. The middle blue is the continuing undefined stuff. The bottom part is the fees. So the cost of the contractors and the fees for the design and the management are completely separate. When you all receive change order lists or when, when change orders come to Kim and Dean for approval, there's zero fees or design in that cost, in those numbers. The above cost, the, the top of the street sheet, sheet there for contractors is all you see. <laughs> If you see $3,000 come through for whatever, steel beam or whatever, purely $3,000 cost from those contractors. Nexus doesn't, Nexus or the architect or the engineer, they don't make more or less money based on any of those change orders. That's all like below the line on the list here. I'll jump in right now. So if you say you guys do not make any money on that, yeah. well, I'm standing here right now looking at the contract it says right here, you make 2.25 of the total construction cost. So when you have extras or updates or you forget stuff on the print, <coughs> that adds a cost up. So at a job, you get that 2.25%. No, that's not right. So it's right here. Let, let me explain to you. That's, that's if the 37 million total for the project were to go up. If the school board would come to us and say, like the, the, the $2 million of interest, if the school board comes to us and says, we want to put the $2 million of interest into the project to raise 37 million to 39 million, <coughs> Nexus would charge 2.25% more to manage that 2 million more. If we stay within $37 million, there's no extra cost to Nexus. But it, it's under bid though. So, you know, that it came underneath. The all the, 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 the I know exactly where you're going because I've gotten this question a hundred times. The fees for architectural and engineering and design and all those fees are based on the budget, not the actual. So when the bids came in, Nexus doesn't get a less fee for bringing in lower bids. Those bids are those fees are pre-accounted for and they don't change based on if it came in over or under. Let me just jump in on that. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If you're trying to work with an organization that doesn't have a conflict of interest. So essentially, the Oconto Falls School District has already paid Nexus based on the project budget. You know that they're going to work their tails off to try to get us under budget bids because it doesn't negatively impact their bottom line. We've paid them to do that already. So it doesn't negatively impact them when we show that we came in under budget. We already paid them based on what the budget was. And it doesn't positively impact them when they bring a change order 
unless the change order gets approved and all of them together go above the budget amount. The 37.6. Right. All, all our fees are based on us knowing this is the budget and this is the prescribed project. And knowing that we have this setup of the contingency is for the use of the work. That's that's how this entire setup is set up beforehand, like like Dean was saying. So so there's no it's truly independent opinion of uh, opinion, whatever you want to call it management. We paid all of these dollars on or have we paid we're scheduled, to, we're scheduled to pay and Kim is going paying it as we go basically. as we, we, in, okay. we invoice monthly as the project goes okay so okay. you're as a percentage of the completion that right. okay yeah. right so our you saw our 1049 balance is at 29 million yet so we paid you know right okay let me go to the next slide so um, <clears throat> some things we kind of talked about already, but some some points we wanted to make. So a lot of um, <laughs> construction projects. So the way Nexus project is set up is there's just a one contingency that everyone can see transparently. Any bid that came in under bid, the extra money went to that contingency line. Any use of the contingency is approved by Kim or Dean of the board based on those dollar amount thresholds that we had already pre discussed. On a lot of Industry projects, there is the owner. There's a there's two separate contingencies. There's an owner contingency and there's a contractor contingency. The contractor contingency is normally set up that I use it at my discretion, and if I don't need it all, I just keep it. Nexus doesn't do that. Nexus looks at okay, we want the money to go back into the project as much as possible because we because we have our preset fees. We're comfortable that we're going to make enough money to be in business and be healthy based off our preset fees. So there's no trying to make more money during the project. So we don't need this contingency of I'm going to take care of it and if I don't use it, I'm going to keep it in my pocket because we're, we're comfortable with our preset fees and we're comfortable that the contingency is going to be there for what needs to be used during the project. And that way we can be a truly independent decision maker of is this best for the project or not to use these dollars for a certain item. One of the things that I wanted to bring up because I think it's important that this whole topic be kept in context. So we could look at this from multiple different angles, but I'm hopeful that people will understand when a change order comes forward to Kim and Mike and I, or you the board, it has come forward because either A, the district has identified something that they're concerned with, um, Nexus or contractors identified somebody, something, or potentially something has been identified through a inspection process, let's say. There's a high level of transparency there. And that's something that you, the board, and the communities that we serve have stated they expect. They want to have transparency. They want involvement from our staff. They wanted feedback to the community when we first got started. And the things that they came at us with, you better stay under budget and you better stay on time. And you better give us a quality product. Well, we are under budget. We are, knock on wood, on time. We quit the April storms. Um, and every time we're doing a change order, it's because we're identifying something that needs to be addressed in order to make it a better product. One of my concerns is that if we get really wrapped around the axle on change orders, I'm, a, I'm concerned that people might not bring them forward. And to, that would be counterproductive. It, it's the exact opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. If somebody sees something, whether it be a staff member, when we talk about time, you, you don't have every single individual in your entire organization involved. You have individuals that are representing other members. Well, they go back and they have conversations and at some point somebody has a different idea and suddenly something else comes forward and it causes a change. Well, that's a good thing. That's, that's sound communication. It doesn't automatically mean that there's some level of neglect. The other thing I want to pitch out there is at times in life, we have conflicting priorities. And managing a project like this absolutely has conflicting priorities. On budget and on time are conflicting. So I'm gonna use an example. 
because this was just brought forward recently, and I think it's a great example. Um, poured a slab here a week or so ago. The weather was questionable, all right? So just like I do with um, deciding whether or not we're gonna have school, which I'm sure everybody can relate, no matter what decision you make, somebody's gonna be happy, somebody's not. Guarantee you, you go to pour that slab, you're looking at the weather and you're trying to decide, is that rain gonna hold off long enough for us to get this slab poured and for it to cure enough that it's not gonna be an issue. You can decide not to pour it and now that sets you back on your timeline. And that's a problem. You can pour it, and if the weather holds off, hey, we did great. If you pour it and the weather comes early and it comes more than was told to you through the, the weather report, well, you can have a problem. Well, quite honestly, we, we had some challenges here recently. It wasn't a natural challenge. It was a cosmetic challenge. But it's a challenge that's going to require us to go and do some grinding to make it work. Well, there's going to be a cost to that grinding, okay? Is it going to be like gigantic? No. But is it going to be a potential change order? Potentially, yes. No. Should it be though? Well, that's why I bring this up in context because I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my two cents because that's what you asked me for. I have to, in your absence, you come together as a board periodically, usually once a month, unless there's a special board meeting. And through our interactions, you give me guidance as a superintendent. And when you're not in session, my job is to do the very best that I can to try to meet your expectations with our teams that educate children and do all the other things that are operational in our school district. I do not have the know-how to run. I do have the ability to interact with somebody who does have the know-how. I will say that if every time I had to call a snow day, you all started questioning why I did that, after a while, I would ask you to just take over that decision making because it's very frustrating. You have a, I think you have a responsibility to question, but if the answers are reasonable, then I also think you have a responsibility to allow the system to work. I do not believe that a situation where we make decisions, some of them are not always going to work out exactly as we anticipate. And consequently, if I'm concerned that Nexus is making a bunch of decisions that are not logical and they're costing the district, my job is to come to you and let you know that as a board. And then we have to meet with Nexus and share our concerns and figure out where we're going from there. We're trying to show you through data right now that we're not seeing that. Now, is Nexus perfect? No, I just gave you an example where a decision was made Rain came faster than was expected. There's some cosmetics that are going to need to be cleaned up. But that to me is a perfect example of what that contingency is there for. Contingency is there that when things don't go as anticipated, it helps to cover that. The intent is not to create a contingency and have all of it left at the end of the project. If that's the goal, that's extremely concerning to me because to me, that's now saying, don't bring me any, any questions or concerns because I'm not going to be able to use contingency money to address them. When you see a problem, we would just move forward and build it. That is absolutely not what I heard our community members say. I heard them say they want a quality product on time and on budget. We're on time, we're on budget. And I believe that we're pushing every day towards that quality product. And when we have a situation that rises, we address it. And, and the, the thing that, I, the, 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 I'm not an analogy, but what I said to Dean when we were deciding to pour the slab that he was talking about, decision every day has a risk and a reward with it. I could, I could guarantee no risk by building a big plastic tent for that concrete slab. I guarantee there would, be, would have been no raindrops on it. What I told Dean, the risk is, it's gonna cost more money to build that tent than it is gonna to be to fix the drips. Mm -hmm. So, and what he was talking about, the schedule delay risk. Should we push off the schedule to ensure that we have no minor problems, or should we anticipate, okay, a minor problem might cause a, might cause a few dollars correction, but we still can move the entire project forward? Risk reward, every decision, every day. This week we have what's called a push-pull meeting. Yes. If you all drive past that, that 
building site right now on, on a day where they're working, you will get some flavor of how many vehicles are there to give you some idea of how many different contractors are working at one time. It is a very complicated choreographed dance that's happening. Push-pull meeting, you take a look at from now until July of 2025, August, July 2025, when we expect to receive the keys and be moving everything in before the first day of school. We back plan from that, all the different pieces that need to happen. Every decision every day affects another piece of a member in the dance. If I decide not to pour that slab, then all of a sudden I'm pushing something back multiple days. Now the person that was supposed to be there tomorrow to work on a slab, it's not there for them to work on. So I guess I, I want to give context because um, recently we, we had a conversation about this topic and it was reported upon, I think very accurately in our local newspaper, but quite honestly, it saddened me because what was reported on talked about things that I felt were out of context. We are under budget for a significant project. We're on time right now. Mother Nature has actually, for the most part, been very beneficial to this. And the next time Mother Nature has a chance to swing at us, we're closer to having weathered in where she's not going to really create as big of a negative impact. So I'm really excited about where we are. When I think about what we were up against four or five months ago, when we were told by folks that were looking at the potential bids and there was worry that we were going to be a million to two million over our budget. So I've talked enough, but we wanted to give you data so that you could have some context for when we bring these to you. So Brett, before you before you go, we, we need to discuss this part, okay? So it, it is good for us to be excited and question things at the same time, okay? Because we are, remember, we are voted positions. We represent the community as a whole. And we have a responsibility to make sure that we are questioning things when we have a question or if a question is brought to us and we are posing that. So, Dean, you, you referenced that if I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're saying if we question too much that people will stop <clears throat> bringing good ideas to the table and, and I don't agree with that, I think that all of the questions are being asked in good faith. Um, I think that they are clearing things up. I, I have conversations outside of, of the boardroom, the concerns that are brought to me, I ask those questions and then clarification is brought and I feel much better every time I leave this room talking about, about the middle school. So don't want us to be afraid to bring things to Brent or to bring things anywhere because it's causing some conflict or some stress. I, I think that we have to keep that in mind. And, Always know that they're always in good faith. Oh, they're right. I would right. assume nothing less. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, I good. think my my concern is what's the what's the end product? And when we went to our communities to gather feedback, one of the things that came out was like sixty or seventy percent of our community members shared that they get information from our community newspaper. Mm -hmm. And the tough part is. Everything that we say and everything we discuss is in open session and can be interpreted. And I guess what I'm pitching out there for all of us to be thoughtful of is how we interact together. Because if the interpretation is that this project is going poorly, I think that's a misrepresentation of what's going on. And it's not that I'm saying we shouldn't ask questions, absolutely. But I hope that that end product outcome is when the questions are answered very reasonably, I hope people walk away feeling whatever that emotion is based on the data, not based on something less than that. So. One other thing I wanna say is keep in mind, the way we have this project set up for as far as the dollars and the budgets and the change orders is the bids were kind of like, the bids are like the, min the minimum absolute requirement, right? If, if, if the school board said to me, give me the price to make sure that nothing goes wrong, take care of everything that nothing goes wrong, then I could have given you that price. I could have figured that in, I could have given you that price. 
But then when things went really well, I wouldn't have told you about the money that I didn't have to spend, anticipated I might have, and I didn't have to spend. But that's not the way we set up this project. We set up this project to get the bids to build the building the minimum cost possible, and then have that contingency for if we need to use things, if the weather's bad, if we need to build a tent to protect us from the weather, then we'll pay for it with a change order when we need to use it, instead of figure the price for everything that could possibly happen, and then if you don't need it, I don't tell you. That, that's not what we wanted here, right? We wanted the open back and forth relationship of let's use the dollars towards good, let's not use the dollars towards what if. Mm -hmm. Good discussion up to this point. Um, I think a lot of valid valid points. Just some context, if you could, um, given that we're at you know eight point eight percent right now. I mean, is that compared to normal pro other projects, whatever? Is that pretty? Where would where would you normally be on that burn burn rate? Um, I think the normal burn rate is something closer to uh, the project continue, project completion rate. Yeah. Um, I think 8.8 is pretty low. I think we've been doing pretty well so far. Um, I would say a lot of our projects, we end up using half of the contingency throughout the project, whether it be owner changes, owner improvements, because we have an opportunity here now that we're under budget, we could add some things that make sense that are dollar appropriate. You know, So I, I would say throughout a lot of my projects, we end up using half of the contingency. <clears throat> Okay. So I guess it bothered me uh, when he said that it's going to be an extra for grinding concrete. Why are we responsible for grinding concrete that because you, you had you you can make the decision. I mean, I have pictures and you can tell a trail machine did not go on that slab. You can tell. I have pictures that you can tell that they street it and they, they ran a brush over that concrete and it okay. as a person that does floor i mean grinding that floor you're going to have to cap it with something else you can't just grind the floor you have to cap it with something else okay that's very possible we haven't gotten into the details of it yet <clears throat> i just don't think it's right for us pay for the grinding, whoever if, pulled the concrete. So I am, I'm saying if, but, I'm, but saying, I'm just saying there if, should be no reason. Is if, if the if the quality of the contract of the concrete was poor because of the installation methods, I completely agree with you. If the contract concrete is poor because we decided to pour it when it was still dripping water on it, yeah, then I don't think so. Yeah. I think yeah, I think we should say, I, I think I'm we should sorry, take this particular yeah, can, one. Yeah. Let me finish because this totally upsets me. 27 years I've been in it, and you know, yes, you want to be under budget and on time. How long have you been doing this? 15 years, 18 years, something. Okay, you know that you will fall behind here and there and catch up. Mm -hmm. That quality out there, and then the, I know a lot of concrete guys, well, it's covered with flooring. But with windows, you will see the waves. You will see the puddles. So then the flooring company will come in and say, oh, we got to fill this. We got to fill that. And then it's an argument who's paying for it. Yeah, there, are, 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 there are arguments every day on the construction side. I, I know it's said. I've been doing it for 27 years. And I'm telling you guys, and it, well, I'm, even, stand, I'm standing yeah. over. I'm saying I'm standing over. We don't even have a change think, order for, yeah. for this yet. Yeah. So, I mean, we can. But and, said, right. they said that there will be probably possible of change order of granting the floor. Right. Or it should not be us. It should not be us paying for it. So, it you tell be. me that they, they come and paint the wall, and it, it's bad. Yeah. Are you going to come and say they come and they want to come and paint the wall? Our job is to make sure that installation is quality, and if the reason for the for the defect is because of on of not proper installation, then the district should not be for that. Listen, I think this particular going over the change order topics absolutely relevant. I think the topic of this particular you know poor challenge, whether we want to bring that up at the next meeting or whatever, or right. determine yeah. what the resolution is on it. You know, to, to go down the to go down the analogy path that kind of Dean uh, I tend to be an analogy or two. It's a bit like 
it's a bit like uh, making the decision in the summer to make hay or not, whether or not the rain's going to hold off to, to you can dry the dry the hay. Sometimes you make the wrong decision on that, and you have to deal with it as you go along. Um, and you guys are working on our our behalf to build it, and there are going to be times when possibly a decision, you know, hindsight, maybe we can do something something different. But you know, now we've got what we've got in this particular situation. Let's determine how we resolve it and and move forward. Um, do you have other? I think let's move on from from this. If that's all right. Um, well, just questions. So. Any other questions of what we talked about so far? And then moving forward, we just want, as has been brought up, we, we're not shying away from questions. We just want to have a response, a thoughtful response. We, I, I agree, open and candid discussion is better than people not discussing things, so that's, that's great. Um, as Dean said, I don't want this to undermine what, what is an incredibly positive project right now. Mm -hmm. We're ahead of schedule. We're under budget. There's going to be a beautiful building for the kids to go into when it's done. So let's remember that, that this is still an amazing thing for the school district. Right? You said staff members walk too. Is there a chance that I can walk on site on Friday? I don't care as long as uh, everything's prearranged so we can have the proper safety precautions you know, set up. That's up, that's up to you all. Okay. Um, so now showing some of the progress of what has happened out there. So since last time we met, um, the steel structure has been completed. Um, the erection of the steel structure has been completed. At least there is some detail welding that's finishing off yet. But um, the steel studs and exterior sheeting is ongoing. The first floor is near completion. The second floor of the steel studs and sheeting is waiting for the four. The second floor, the academic wing that has the two-story area, we have to pour the concrete floor first, and then that, the walls sit on top of that concrete floor. So that uh, concrete floor is scheduled to happen this week, weather pending, and then you'll see the rest of the exterior steel studs and sheeting be completed. Um, roofing is also beginning. Um, here, I'll show you, talk to you more pictures first. Um, here's the inside of the building. Um, showing the underground piping that's been going on, electrical and plumbing wise has been doing underground piping. Here's in some of the bathroom and kitchen areas. Here is um, some more of the steel superstructure on the right, standing on top of what is going to be the second story area of the academic wing where there will be concrete poured on top of that metal decking. On the left, as you can just see some of the steel stud work ongoing for the exterior wall. Um, is the guys pouring the concrete. So on the left is them preparing with the plastic vapor barrier that goes under the concrete and getting that all around all the pipes and everything. On the right is the crew pouring some of that concrete. That's for the first floor slab in the academic wing right there. Um, on the right is just more pictures from the exterior, the, the seeing the sheeting and the, and the framing going on for the exterior walls. And then coming up, um, so pouring, as I said, the pouring the concrete for the second floor of the academic wing is going to be hopefully this week, weather pending. Um, then we're going to move into pouring the concrete floor for the gym after that. Um, as I said, the exterior framing and sheeting is ongoing. And then the masonry brick veneer has started and will be keep ongoing for a couple months. They started around the back in the tech ed wing and then they'll be working around the south to the front. Um, and that roof is also going to be starting soon. Um, right now we're working on the wood blocking that goes underneath of the roofing and then the roofing will start on uh, the multi-purpose fitness area. Um, in the next couple of weeks, and the GM roofing is already completed. Um, and then just a review of our overall milestone that we always show. So um, the project is slated to be open in August of 25 for the start of school. Um, so we are on schedule, if not a little bit ahead of schedule. The winter, as Dean said, the winter was very kind to us. We got ahead of the schedule a little. The last couple of weeks, we've had to push off some of the concrete pours because of the snow and rain. So we've lost a little bit of that, um, of that ahead of schedule, but we still are on, on, if not a bit ahead of schedule. Any further questions? No. So, what, so the high school, is it the, oh, the elementary roofing job? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, the elementary roofing job has been contracted out from the bids that, that you all approved. Um, we are gonna start some of the masonry work um, ahead of time during school. 
Um, whereas at the, the high wall where the gym roof is, there's some five rows of bricks we're going to tear out and put a new building flashing in. We're going to start that work. And then um, the roofing will start as soon as school's out and be completed uh, by <coughs> early August is the schedule. Okay. Thanks for coming in, Brent. Okay. Thanks a lot. I'm right. going to again. So <coughs> I won't have an opportunity to speak to this chair in the future, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, looking back at this whole process from the time of the well, prior this referendum passing it, uh, and, and then this one, uh, but there was a lot of heartburn that, that we had to deal with with uh, the effects of the supply chain issues, and uh, uh, it, it cost increases and so on. And as was mentioned, uh, we were looking at, you know, what are we going to have to cut out of here. Uh, are out of the plan in order to be able to, uh, to build this uh, building. And so it's a very uh, pleasant surprise uh, to me to see how things have turned around. And uh, so I, a lot of that has to do, I can remember when Russ was here, when we were talking about design, uh, the wealth of knowledge that uh, Nexus has and uh, put into and to what we should be able to anticipate as far as costs and timelines and those kind of things has, uh, has served us very well on this project. So I'm uh, very happy and um, want to uh, commend and thank Nexus for the job that they're doing for us in managing this, this project. I couldn't imagine doing it as it's us being the general contractor. So it's something that uh, I think we're going to end up having a quality product that's going to be a source of pride in the community and so happy to see that it's that's going forward. All right. Uh, no action needed on that topic. Thanks, Ken. All right, on to new business. Uh, next up, we've got Matt Maloney Memorial proposal. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you for letting us have some time agenda this evening. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Randy Maloney. I am the president of Team Trent, and I am Trent's mom. I am Tracy Trent. I'm Tegan's mom, and I'm the treasurer. I'm Sheila Fisher. I am Trevor's mom and a friend in, uh, Trevor was his Trent's friend and teammate. I'm Beth Trotto. I'm the secretary. I'm East Coast mom who was also Trent's friend and teammate. I'm Kelly Schrader, donations coordinator, uh, mom of Nick, Trent's friend and teammate. And I am Joanna Boren, vice president of Team Trent, and my son is Max, who is also Trent's friend and teammate. Um, together, along with the support and other board members that we have, um, we are Team Trent. We are a community nonprofit organization created to honor our friend and teammate, Trent Gregory Maloney, who passed away on February 28th, 2020, at the age of only nine due to complications from cardiac arrest he suffered five weeks prior. Trent enjoyed his Hot Wheels collection, playing baseball with the O'Connell Falls Rec League, and playing basketball with the O'Connell Falls Hoops Club. Trent's passion for sports and love for baseball has led us to organizing and establishing Trent Maloney Memorial Inc. in order to fund student scholarships, to assist other local nonprofit organizations and to support youth sports in the O'Connell Falls community. So our goals in starting Team Trent were obviously to honor Trent, uh, to give back to O'Connell Falls, to involve our community. And then we have had this long ending goal of creating a little more permanent as a result of what we started. Um, we've accomplished many of the goals that Team Trent first set out to do. Um, we've created events and memorials in honor uh, of Trent to recognize him and remember him. We've awarded yearly scholarships, which we plan to continue to do through 2029. We have supported other local nonprofit organizations in the community, and we still have our sights set on a larger, more permanent community goal. Uh, we proudly create a community event uh, where we gather and share and create positive memories in Trent's name. We've set aside the second Saturday uh, in August annually to host the Memorial Baseball <coughs> Tournament for Trent. 
We recognize in our committee that the O'Connell Falls School District has many facilities that we can be proud of. Our football field, our new softball fields, the PAC, the field house, and soon our brand new middle school. These facilities allow us to host competitions, events, games, meets, and performances. They allow us to welcome people into our community, which benefits all of us. But the one missing facility, again, the one missing facility are baseball fields, which is why we're here to speak to you today. The support we have received from our community so far has been fantastic. Not only have we been able to do multiple scholarships every year, but we plan to do so through 2029. But we have another new goal. We think it would be pretty awesome to have a permanent structure, a place for friends, family, and our community to gather and enjoy in Trent's name. We want to build baseball fields on naming rights for Trent Maloney. Our purpose today um, is to get a commitment from the school board, from you, to build fields on the school property with the help of Trent Memorial, Maloney Memorial, allow us to help the district in seeking donations and support from the community in building this facility. Sorry. Um, so we need your help. Um, we want to create something permanent and we want Trent's name attached so his friends, family, and the community can visit and remember him for years to come. A reason why is Trent. Building this will give us a place of remembrance. Kelly's on deck. I am. <laughs> Um, this will be a beautiful facility to match our other facilities um, that Beth had already mentioned, PAC, ST Paper. Um, this can also help us save money. We no longer have to bus players to bus the athletes to Abrams daily for games, practices, etc. Um, again, that may help with the bus driver's shortage. <laughs> um, and then we wouldn't have to pay the, the rental fee for, for the city to um, play on the fields. And this also allows our JV and varsity teams to play simultaneously in one location. Also, safety first for our kids. Um, the current field has divots in them. Um, don't need to turn an ankle or anything. Um, the facility currently is aging. Um, there's also risk with um, the location being on a main street and fall balls. Um, being hit into it. And being on that street, there's limited parking um, and different things. So with this new facility, um, it would be centrally located. And again, like our other ones, we can host events and bring in money to the community and local businesses. Why now? We understand that this is not a quick process and it could take up to a couple of years. Goal is to have the class of 2029, which would be Trent's graduating class, so all of Trent's friends and teammates, um, to play their first game their freshman year on this diamond. We want them to be able to think of their friend while they're playing that game, and we can honor him in that aspect. Um, we are willing to make a donation, and we want to commit to helping get more to help build this facility. Donation letters do go out in May, so we are looking forward to hearing from you at your next board meeting in May. And now, <laughs> the more important members of our committee here. We know you are in the business of doing what is best for kids, and we are those kids. We are looking for your support. Help us build a facility to play in, a facility to be proud of and honoring our friend Trent. We are here today asking you to make a motion to commit to this project. Thank you for your time, Gold Panthers. <laughs> Very good, boys. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll uh, open it up for uh, questions, comments, discussion. Um, Go from there. First off, uh, before we kick it off, thank you all for coming in. Not a dry eye in the house, probably online either. Um, and uh, sincerely appreciate you guys bringing this. Um, 
A, the community involvement and everything around Trent and just everything that it represents. So thank you. Thank you for that first off. And then we'll open up for board members, people to discuss and talk a little bit more on the topic discussed here. So the motion that they're looking is is just for us to partner. Is that what you guys are looking for? Is, is partnership in this? Okay. <coughs> We're willing, we're willing to make a donation, but we know it, it's got to come from you and it, on your facility, you have to, you're running everything. So it's really, we're looking for you to commit if we make this donation that we're going to have these fields built. Always want to play. It's like Someone building the field of dreams. That it's kind of like if you need to buy a new car, <laughs> you only need a new car, <laughs> and somebody comes along and I have a bunch of money to help you get started in buying your new vehicle. We see the need for the baseball field, and we have some money to help you get started on making that process happen, and we'll help continue to raise money as long as the project is going. Well, I think all of us know Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Um, but with that statement, um, do we have a financial number as to what it could cost as far as you know your donation on top of fundraising? And are we talking a million dollars, one point? Like, is there a number that we can wrap our head around as to the price tag of two fields on the property? I think we would defer that to you guys because we would have to find, if we found builders for the school, mm -hmm. we would find experts in building the baseball fields and mm -hmm. get bids. Okay. You know, we know what we have, but okay. we don't know what we need exactly sure. yet. And it, <clears throat> it all fluctuates based on what you want. Right, rest of it. <laughs> would, so, your, <laughs> would your donation change if we were collaborating with um, the other sports that we have at the, at the middle school. So we're going to have a need for a football field or some green space for them to play football. Um, introduction of other sports that could come on, on green grass. Would that still be something that you ladies would consider a donation and try if we combined facilities like that? Or is it you would like the baseball field separate and I guess I'm a little confused because you need a varsity baseball field, I would assume, on our school property. Yeah. And in order to, to be a fully varsity baseball field, you need a dedicated space for it. So sometimes you can double up some of that green space in the outfield as, as green space for football. Um, outside it'd be baseball too, baseball yeah, outfield. baseball season. So. There are some of the designs <coughs> that were happening at the city for Memorial Field at one point. That's how they were building those fields, as they were a combo. Um, and they saved a significant amount of money by doing that. So, and I think those are all things we would need to discuss. Sure. Uh, this is just very prelim sure. conversation. Yeah. Um, and I think too, some of the things that were discussed on a earlier slide are, you know, those costs of busing some of our players to Abrams for games and whatnot. I mean, I think there's some savings that could be realized too as a district um, in addition to. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, those are all factors and things that would need to be talked about. Mm -hmm. right. I think some of those factors too are, are things the board has to consider. You know, we've been concentrating on getting this building built. <coughs> so been, there's been a lot of discussion by a lot of groups on what they would like to see uh, developed on that land. And I, uh, we certainly can consider uh, everything and make a good point is that's, that's facilities we don't have that are, right. that are uh, convenient and uh, meet the needs. But uh, I think I, the, be the best bet is going to be we'll get the building built and then we can start looking at, at uh, the use of the, uh, of the, of the rest of the land. And I would guess that it probably wouldn't take a real long time to to develop a plan for a baseball field if that was the decision that we were to make. Right. Dean, re real realistically, what is you know if if this were to come to fruition, what what would a timeline look like in just in your quick synopsis? So a couple different things. Um, I mean, prior to the meeting tonight, we've been having conversations about the overall time frame of the middle school build, and 
we're anticipating that Kim is going to be coming to the board. Kim, we were kind of looking at the August, September timeframe, correct? Yeah. So in the August September timeframe, you're going to have, you know, Kim showed you the blue area of that one slide of work that's yet to be done. Well, a big piece of that work that's yet to be done is the roofing at the elementary school. So that should be done by then. We will have another four or five months of the middle school project completed. So you're going to have more information and then you're going to start to have a conversation um, in that timeline of what do you have available and you're going to start those initial conversations about what options do you want to consider. So I alluded to, we went out for a referendum capital the first time and it failed. There were different parts of projects that were on that first capital referendum request that had to be taken off. And one of them was ball fields. Um, we had ball fields, we had cafeteria at Abrams, we had transportation loop <coughs> consideration at Con Falls Elementary. Um, there was different things that were pulled off to try to streamline something that we felt the taxpayers would support based on the feedback they gave us. Anticipate that you as a board would hear Kim's informational dialogue this fall to understand, you know, how far are you and at what point do you feel you're going to have a strong understanding of some of the things we talked about earlier. I would say the closer you get to the end of the project, the more um, confident you are where you're at financially and that level is going down every time you get closer to the end of the project. So you may have to try to decide um, not just the question of support, but when are you feeling confident in giving that support? Um, every time we do a financial, we talk to you about Kim, you know, mentioned that we were under budget. So the contingency right now was scheduled to be 1.5 for the middle school project. And right now it's just under 1.9. And of that, we've invested 174,000 in those change orders. So how much of that will be left is one question. You also have your interest earnings, which right now Kim mentioned tonight is somewhere in the city of $2 million. Um, you also have fund 46 <coughs> that we report on each month. Fund 46 is currently three and a half million dollars approximately. Those are dollars that we set aside for future capital projects. Go ahead. What about fund 80? Um, fund 80 is a community service fund and there might be, might be some bits of it that could come out of fund 80. But fund 80 is very prescriptive as to how it can be used. Um, has to be open to the community. So an example is we use some of our fund 80 for our fitness center to offset the cost so that right now community members can come use our fitness center at no cost. It's open to everybody in the community um, within the hours and the age limits and whatever, but there's some room for that, but it's probably not real significant. You have to look at it. As far as total time project like that, I would think that, you know, if we go back to what it took us to do the softball fields, which was before my time, I think that was a couple of years. Um, we could talk with Mike Bushy to get more specific, but you have your design efforts, you have your trying to gather the funds, and then you have the building. I know that with the softball, one of the things Mike has told me that when they started shoveling the dirt, the funding started coming in because Sometimes people will hold back until they know that you're serious. And when they see that, okay, you're going to make this happen, I'll step forward. And I mean, that's a perfect example of, of the, the willingness of the communities that this make up our district, you know, have come forward in the past to make it happen. I can look into try to give you some, a better answer to that question. Like I wrote down, I need to try to figure out, you know, park of a cost, a ballpark of a time. And I owe that back to you. Yeah. Um, 
Again, thank you all for coming in. My daughter was also a friend of Trent's and in the same grade, so I uh, near and dear to my heart as well. Um, I, I think the matching of time of the, when the, the middle school will get closer to completion and also being cognizant of the, you know, the, the first referendum, which included a lot of, a lot of other projects after obviously was shot down. So we want to be very conscious, conscious of, you know, how we utilize dollars, any dollars left over or other dollars that we may have to do the project. I think the, um, two things, one, I think the board generally on these sort of topics, you know, would like some more time to discuss, learn things in the community, have conversation, that'd be the first thing. The second is I could, I guess my thought is I could see us doing something about entering at least the feasibility, you know, confirming board is willing to go into a feasibility phase. Mm -hmm. What is the costing? What does design look like? What would timing have to be? Um, I think we're already being pro my understanding is we're already at least being somewhat proactive while dirt is being moved over there to be conscious of where, where things go such that in the master plan and the long-term plan whether it's two years from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now that we can support the facilities and not you know waste valuable you know heavy equipment time um while we have it on so I think the thought is if you can give us some more time, you know, a month to think about it. And then I think the thing I would push up to the board is just, is there any consensus on like some sort of commitment, call it a feasibility roadmap, start thinking about what the costs are, whatever. And would do you think a commitment, something along those lines would be enough to where you have comfort level of saying, we think the board is serious. About this. I mean, our ability to right now, or even a month from now say, yes, we're going to go and do this, like, let's start planning right now. I think we need some some time to keep that ball rolling, but consensus may be in that that direction. I don't want to speak, up, speak on behalf of the entire board, but um, I guess comments from you, the Trent team or, or from the board on those ideas. I, I would agree with you in the feasibility state of it to get the ball rolling, and I I would just like the community to understand whoever's listening right now that, you know, the Trent Maloney committee has come to us with this. It's, you know, this is a wonderful organization who's doing something for a wonderful little boy. So, you know, anytime that we have the opportunity to um, embark on something like this, I think we have to take those steps to, you know, go through the process and see what we can do to make something like this work. Mm -hmm. So I would support the feasibility start of this. Can you guys um, talk at all about maybe some conversations that maybe you've had within the community about maybe other entities supporting this as well in the community? I think we were hesitant to reach out and tell you. Got it. But okay. Yeah, I mean, I know we have one other person that's interested in contributing somehow. Um, and I think kind of Dean, like you said, once you start building something, we might be very surprised at how many people might, you know, want to honor one of their loved ones mm -hmm. at these ball fields or, you know, have a monetary donation or, or whatever it might be. So mm -hmm. I think, too, uh, uh, Clint, your suggestion of just to look at uh, maybe getting consensus with the board on a feasibility process uh, would be a good a, a good start, you know, you can collect information, have that back for the rest of you next month and uh, can uh, uh, go forward. Baseball facilities are something that we are going to need. You know, we can't be going to Abrams forever right. to play baseball, mm -hmm. especially as uh, important as that sport is in this town. And so uh, to have a group that's ready and willing to uh, cooperate with us, and uh, I think is uh, something that would stand us in good stead as far as generating some additional private contributions and donations towards the project, uh, as well as getting it managed and built. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just going to go ahead and honor the request and make a motion for the feasibility phase or approach or however you want to label it to begin and um, see where this takes us in the future. I'll second that. Motion by Brian. Second. Is 
second by Carrie. Kind of begin a, call it a usability cost estimates, just kind of the initial legwork of what would, you know, anything, anything entail. Um, I think we, does everyone understand the, understand the motion? Am I saying it appropriately? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion by Brian, second by Carrie. Any other discussion on the topic? Um, I guess I just have one question. So do you want us to come back and present in May? And then at that point, whatever you buy from the feasibility of the discussion, that would be our time that we send out our letters for our fundraiser this August. So if we could advertise at that point, you could come to some sort of decision so we can say, yes, this is, we're going to be collecting donations for this in the future. Or if we don't get it by May, I'm just saying that would be another year off for us. So I don't, I don't know that we will be ready in May to commit financially to the project mm -hmm. yet, just because we're not far enough into the build and far enough into completion to be able to commit dollars mm -hmm. at this point. So we have to make sure that that middle school gets built because that's what the taxpayers mm -hmm. have given us that money for. Um, we totally understand timing, but but we're just not, not there yet. I, am I, is that so consensus? Right. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's where I'm, I'm at. Possibly August, September, you know, when Kim, Kim will have a better idea of, uh, of how the, the finances are going to flow as far as completing the uh, completing the, the middle school itself, and then seeing what resources we might have available for other projects. Yeah, I, I think it's a way of saying that we're there, there's interest in continuing discussions. Not, I don't think the board's at a point where we can given the where the, the middle school is at and you know and, and what we may or may not use for contingency yeah. or anything else or what other competing projects there may be but i think that we're willing to at least you know dedicate some time and attention to location cost what would things look like and then i think probably the thing we would yeah and i realize it puts you in a little bit of a challenge of okay well can we really receive donations or can we only get commitments of donations and people don't give them right away um uh you know, but at some point in time, like under a, we need to understand what's the what what would a project like this even cost? Yes, we probably have some prior work that was that was done in some of the schematics, and then second is you know from you all like what you don't know yet what like a donation might end up being. Are we talking ten thousand dollars? Are we talking a hundred thousand? You know, it's it's something. So I think there's a lot of moving pieces that have to come together here, but I think you're getting at least commitment from the board that we're open to assuming this motion passes that we're open to at least continuing the conversation and working on some of what those cost estimates would look like so um, any other comments um, need a tissue nope, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be able to say this um rainy and greg i wish you didn't have to be here tonight um i wish that i when i was listening to it i just kept thinking it I wish they wouldn't even have to be here to present this, but how amazing of um, the Trent Maloney Memorial um, Group to turn something very, very well into such an amazing opportunity for um, our community, family, and Trent's friends. Um, so sorry that you have to be here tonight, but I am extremely impressed with the amount of work and dedication um, and preparation um, for you to come here. Um, I'm, I think that you could tell from all the sniffles that it's going to be a very difficult, um, it's going to be very hard for us to be unbiased when we make a decision <laughs> because we, um, we all um, in one way or another feel very, very strongly about um, what this um, and how this has impacted your family and this has impacted the community. One of the just logistical questions I have is that um, I think the goal that you had in mind was for Trent's friends to play on the field during the freshman year. Would that be, I think is that May of 20, or, um, spring of 2026, is that your goal? Is that like, it's the timing right in my mind on that? If because of 
timing and because we do have to be good stewards of our community and the budget that um, our community members approved and how we were a little crucified at first for putting baseball fields in the plan on the first referendum. Um, but also knowing that um, this opportunity could possibly sway community to say, you know what, there's a there's mm -hmm. additional funding here. Right. It would all be coming from tax dollars. But knowing the timing, would you still be able, would you still want to commit to partner with us if that May 20 or that 2026 spring is not would not yeah, happen. So. Okay. okay. Took me a long time to get to that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, good. I'm then in that case, um, that's all I needed to ask. Uh, I'm, I'm sensing that the need. Does anyone feel we need to do a roll call vote on this one? Yeah. Okay. Discussion over. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, uh, transportation department update. Another topic. I don't have a place. You Okay, so. Um, I guess I can lead us out and members of the transportation committee, you can jump in as you feel comfortable. Um, and I think Brandy is here in the audience as well. Um, and Kim and Brandy and other members of our transportation committee team. So the first thing is, is again, we talk about, you know, keeping things in context. So this is some data that shows you our current reality in 23, 24. Um, you have 16 routes and we have 16 drivers, which if you're not invested in the system on a day-to-day -day basis, that seems like a pretty good situation. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Um, during the 23-24 school year, we've had multiple drivers that have had to be out due to medical needs, and those are extended times out. Um, as you can imagine, people get sick. You can tell from my voice. Um, we have people who take some time away with their family. So we have very few subs. Uh, essentially, our subs are, for the most part, internal. Um, they're people who already work for us part-time. In some cases, they're retired drivers that we coax, Randy coaxes to come back. Um, without those folks all stepping forward, uh, there's no way that this would all work. So. If any of those people are listening tonight, we greatly appreciate it. We have staff members who um, are coaches and are often driving uh, buses to our ball games and meets um, and different activities. Again, without them, it doesn't work. Unfortunately, we are losing some of our drivers because they're they're aging out. Uh, a couple people are on the agenda tonight who are planning to retire at the close of the 23-24 school year and will not be available. So as a committee, we looked at a couple different options. One is to maintain the current one mile situation. That's not sustainable um, to have 15 routes and 14 drivers. We're barely holding on by our fingernails now. Um, we talked about the fact that we have staff members that are coming in early and staying late in order to answer phones so that supervisors and mm -hmm. um, mechanics and other members of our staff are driving and driving vans. So we looked at um, what is sustainable and it's not because we think it's a good idea. Um, we're just trying to not find ourselves like some school districts have over promised and under delivered. Um, what they've done is they've done something like the middle column and on a weekly basis they're calling up parents on a say we're not going to be able to pick your children up today or get them home or get them home in which case families are scrambling um so we're trying to look at something that we feel is sustainable 
that gives you just kind of the big picture, but we also want people to know what we've been doing to try to not be in that situation. So we have been very proactive trying to increase compensation in order to retain the drivers that we had um, and also trying to recruit new drivers. Um, things like paying, paying for folks to come in and, and get their CDL. It's important to note that we have an absolutely outstanding CDL trainer in Rex. Um, I can tell you personally, because I've been through it twice now, I just redid my CDL here this last month. Um, Rex is a master instructor. If you pay attention and you learn the material that he tells you you need to become proficient at, when you go to Marinette to take your test, you will pass. Um, just a really good instructor. He's a gem and we, I feel very um, appreciative that we have him helping us. And if you know anybody that's gone out to get their CDL um, out on the market, it's expensive, um, thousands and thousands of dollars to go get that same CDL. We've implemented bonuses, um, not just for our drivers, but also for staff that refer drivers. Um, we also have bonuses once they're in the system for staying in the system. So kind of a retention bonus. Some of the things that we do to recruit, um, we get the word out consistently, constantly. People are I'm, I'm being told, yeah, Dean, you don't have to say it. I know we need bus drivers. Well, we, we can't afford to assume thing. We need to get it out there. And we're trying to lead by example. I mean, I mentioned we have, we have a lot of staff. I don't know the number off the top of my head because we've really ramped up. When we can't find a bus driver, we've tried to um, solve problems through van driving. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need a CDL to drive a van. So we have support staff members, there's administrators that are driving vans to go get kids in the beginning of the day and to take kids home. And again, this is way outside their normal responsibilities. So we're, we're successful in spite of the system. Um, I can't I can't say that enough uh, because without their good um, Without their passion to try to make things work, we, we wouldn't accomplish what we need to do. Next slide. So unfortunately, in our current situation, we're bringing you what I feel is, um, it, it's not in the best interest of kids. It, it is not. Um, we don't feel good about this. We're frustrated by it. But when we look at, are there stones that we've not, you know, overturn to go look for another answer, um, we're not finding them. I mean, people say, well, why don't you just go and hire Cobison or Lamers? Cobison and Lamers are not finding people either. Um, we currently, I give you examples of all the ways that we turn into a pretzel to make this work. Um, I, I feel that based on data, we are able to respond better because we run our our transportation internally. Mm -hmm. People call us and request something mm -hmm. and we strive to help them. My child missed the bus. Can you meet me at this intersection so I can get them on the bus? Um, we do those things. These are not the norm. And we, we do a lot of work to try to meet people's requests. Unfortunately, we're struggling right now to sustain the one mile. Again, hanging on by fingernails. Um, it's not something that can continue based on the fact we're about to lose two more people. And even though we have internal folks going and getting our CDL, um, we don't have other folks stepping forward. So you see our recommendation up there. If you go to the two mile, we would look at moving the, the concentric circle. At this point, the concentric circle is based on the current Washington Middle School, kind of Falls Elementary and the high school. Mm -hmm. And we've established a centralized point. Um, I think it's Wisconsin Street. And if you do this, rather than doing it twice, we would move it to take into account where the new middle school is going to be. And from the new middle school site, Ocon Falls Elementary High School, we'd, we'd identify a new central location and develop a concentric circle outside the slide. 
So this is like a north half of that concentric circle. Gives you an idea of where that two would be. You can see how the eye can come down. And then we can see the south. And we're not saying this is a great idea, but we're trying to be realistic and not tell people what they want to hear and then not be able to produce it. Right. It's important to note that if the board takes action on this, it allows the planning to move forward. It's also important to note that if something out of the current reality changes, we will bring it back to the board. Mm -hmm. um, if we get half a dozen new bus drivers come in, we can come back to the board and say, hey, we got half a dozen people that are willing to join us as regular route drivers. And we can now start to look at going backwards and being able to bus more kids. Something else that I want to bring up is there's a misunderstanding out there that it's all about room on a bus. That's part of what we have to consider. But the other thing that we have to consider is the length of time on a bus. Mm -hmm. So when I first came to the district back in 2015, I think we had somewhere in the vicinity of 19 or 20 routes. And the length of time that a child was on a route was a lot less than it is now when you're trying to run out to all the outskirts of our district and get them back to school. Right now, it's not uncommon for our kids to be on a bus anywhere from an hour and 15 to an hour and 45, and more towards the hour and 45 in a lot of routes. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a perfect world. In, in a better case, we would have plenty of drivers, and we wouldn't have to be bringing this. <clears throat> we recognize the challenges that this brings to families, um, and we don't in any way uh, understate that. I mean, I, I don't feel that this was a choice at all. This was where where backs are in the corner at this point. We don't. In the transportation committee, we've talked about this over and over again. I, we're at a point where we cannot. It is not about a fiscal issue. It is not about a time. Well, I mean, a little bit of time, but it is absolutely about not having enough drivers to cover the roads that would have to be covered if we did make a change and being unable to recruit yes yeah. yep mm -hmm. yep we have looked at everything possible we have compared other districts that hold their own busing other busing companies we are in the top half i would say of compensation scales um and and i really just don't think it's a a pay thing <coughs> right i Any mean other? it's brandy's here and you know she's the girl's been through it <laughs> you know she's been trying everything also when um so those of you that are in the audience right now that um maybe didn't know this part. I mean, we, we truly are looking at every, every possible way that we could make this work. We don't, we are in the business of children, like Max said. Um, we want to make sure that we can provide anything that we can to any children. Um, but at this point, I don't know how we can do it. We, we just can't. What other, what other alternatives have you looked at? Have you looked at starting different schools at different times? Um, like Plasky. Um, yeah, there's some communities out there that um, some places, and this is where the geography of our school district plays a significant role. And I'll use Eshwabanon, okay? Um, if you look at the boundary of Eshwabanon, like it's tiny, all right? Um, they have a snowstorm, so what? Majority of the kids can walk. I mean, it's not very far. We go all the way from up north of Kelly Lake all the way down to the bay. It's 40 some miles from the northwest down to the southeast. And our ability to, let's say, run a double route. So all of a sudden I'm going to go out and I want to get kids and I'm going to go out and get another group of kids. 
Well, unfortunately, I can't do realistically a double route that only gets kids from one or two things and then does the next one. I still have to cover the entire district. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like all my elementaries live in a certain spot. Right. And so my ability to stagger the, the, the start and end times, it's not, it's not realistic. Um, the other thing that you look at is if you stagger your start times, you're also staggering your end times. And if we're the only ones that are staggering our end times, and now all of a sudden things like your after school activities and your ability to get kids to all your events and yet be able to get back in time to run your afternoon routes, um, it's right. we're, we're really stuck. Now, again, I mentioned how appreciative we are because we have coaches that have went and got their CDL, not all of them, but those that have, have, have really put that um, ability on the table for us to still make it work. Without them doing that, it doesn't work. Uh, staff members that before they go to their job have said, yes, I'll go pick those two kids up with a van. So they're starting the day off an hour early, come in, get a van, go get the kids, maybe drop them off, and then opposite at night. Without them doing that, we're not, <laughs> we're not able to accomplish our job right now. So, yeah, we've looked at different options. In some cases, it'll work in somebody else's district. Doesn't mean it'll work in ours just because of the difference in the district, in the geography of the district. Um, I'm not going to say that we looked at everything because I, I don't, how can I tell you that, you know? If we don't but know about something. I can tell you how much I don't want to be here telling you about this. <laughs> I mean, anybody in the right mind doesn't want to come in and pitch this at all. Have you looked so. at mutual meeting points? Like all of our kids walk to the end of our road and that they needed the stop sign. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the logistics of how the bus would have to turn around. But like all of our kids walk down and meet at the stop sign. <coughs> so it's six kids on the bus, super fast. Or have you looked at things like, I can't drive a bus. I can't even fathom how people do. Amanda Fisher always tells me that I can do it. She believes in me, but I'm like, I don't think I can do it. But have you looked at, I could drive a van and pick up kids. <coughs> like, has that been addressed at all of those types of jobs being out there? Because that I wouldn't even apply for a bus job, but I would apply to we drive a van. Well, the problem with with the van scenario is we use it very specifically for certain scenarios that have a small number of kids. The van scenario isn't going to really help us for the magnitude of not being able to run two or three bus routes. But it would help you for the kids that, we live downtown Ohio. Our kids can't safely get to school unless they are driven in a car. The kids that live in the trailer park cannot safely get to school without being driven. Yeah. So like I can understand right. kids in town that have a sidewalk all the way to school. I, um, I, by the way, I mean, you know, normally during the, during the discussion, we don't, you know, there's not, uh, there's obviously an opportunity to talk early on the community involvement and after that. So, but we are, are allowing some dialogue to go back and forth here. And I, I hope everyone appreciates the amount of effort that's gone into it. I, I think that the same, your comment is absolutely valid. I think it's the same. I mean, if you look at the map, there's, there's people that are on the other side of the river out on Conitz or in other places that, you know, nobody has, I mean, nobody in that two mile circle I don't think anybody that's on the outwards part of it has has sidewalks, um, and uh, we had a lot of work by the um, you know new board members. And Carrie, you were added to the bus committee, right? Um, Emily, you as well, and um, so we had not only the you know feedback coming in from community members, boards, but you know everybody involved. And I think the recommendation right now, unfortunately. Um, and as Dean stated, you know, without much interest from the board of, of, ex of saying this is the this is the right answer because this is not the right answer. I think from a planning standpoint, the recommendation is move forward with this, but continue to 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 try to. I mean, we really need an upswell, a further upswell in the community. I feel like to, to try to shake the trees and, and get people to realize how challenging of a situation we're in and to get some people to raise their hands and say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to, to go become a bus driver. Let me give an example real quick. 
Um, this week I'm driving a route. One of the most difficult things of driving a route is knowing where you're going. I and mean, it sounds silly, but you need to go pick up kids along a 30 mile stretch that you may not be familiar with. So I went and drove it this weekend, got the 70% solution. A young man gets on the bus. He's one of the first kids this morning, about 640. He sees me, does the classic, you know, <laughs> what am I doing? You're not my driver. Sits down, you you have um, turn by turn directions that you're trying to reference as you're driving safely. This young man sees this, comes up and says, could you use a hand finding where to go? I said, yeah, I, uh, I said, I'd appreciate the backup. Hey, no problem. So he sat and helped me. <laughs> that same thing happened in the past until I got to know the route. I share that because there's still people out there who think that the buses are the buses that they rode on 45 years ago. They're not. It's an automatic. It's not a stick shift anymore. You don't have to determine how to use the stick. It's a transmission. And there's young people, besides all the support systems we put in place, this young man helped me out today. I still have to call his mom and say, that's a lot. <laughs> but my point in sharing that is, it's a team effort. So if you're out there listening and you're like, well, I couldn't do that. It's pretty awesome when you have a seventh grader who steps up and says, could you use a hand? Yeah, I absolutely could. And made it go much smoother and helped as far as the safety of that situation. Because I didn't have to reference my turn, my turn directions at the same level. <laughs> So one of, the, one of the comments that I've gotten from several people that I've talked to and others would be qualified. Some have their CDLs already, uh, but their comment is, well, I don't want to deal with the kids. And so maybe that's the point that we need to make. It's my understanding that that is pretty well taken care of. I mean, kids mm -hmm. are, with the, with the help of the principals and others, uh, that's, that's not an issue. So or, it, much, or much of an issue. I will tell you that kids are kids and we still have some challenges, but I will also say that we're being a lot more proactive and if, if they're making poor choices, we talk to the young people and we also talk to their families and we say, listen, this cannot be the reason that somebody decides not to drive. So if your behavior mm -hmm. continues, you'll be off the bus for a few days. And if that doesn't get the attention and change the behavior, it'll be off for longer periods of time. And again, we don't do that. We're not focused on the punishment. We're focused on changing the behavior to be more reasonable. And most most young people will change the behavior. And the conversation in the last couple of years is happening much more quickly than so the reporting to the parents is happening live time. Yeah. Bus drivers involved, brandy involved, principals are involved everybody's involved that has to be and they're all on the same page so it's not a situation where a week later somebody's reaching out to the parents it's it's now Dean could you just maybe speak on you know something discussed in in the committee you know just one more option that we thought of to try to, to salvage this in any way about what we discussed about Abrams yeah um and if I get sideways, Brandy, step in, please. Um, we that could we maintain the one mile in Cow Falls and implement a one mile at Abrams? And unfortunately, when Brandy went through and worked with the drivers and looked at, it's not just about the Abrams piece, but then you also have, um, what's the name of the, not transition bus, but a transfer bus. transfer bus, thank you. We don't gain the or another way of looking at it, it doesn't enable us to cut a route by implementing some type of one or a two mile radius at Abrams. We still end up with needing the same amount of route. All we did was create negative impact on families down in Abrams. We're not trying to create negative impact. We're trying to minimize that negative impact and still realize the ability to cut two routes and so what we brought forward to you enables us to do that because we feel we can potentially sustain that. Something that I'm going to be upfront and honest, we're still worried about even this proposal. Like we have right now, we showed you 14 routes and 14 drivers. 
if we have one or two more drivers decide to leave us between now and next fall, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, really, I mean, it's concerning. And I just want to comment on that as well so people really understand, like, what we're going through. Going into next year, like, yes, most everybody has agreed or, you know, yeah, we plan on being here. But we still have to take into consideration we have two drivers that will be turning 70 years old. So that means that when they turn 70, every single year they have to have a new DOT physical. Every other year they will have to re buy their CDL. So instead of going every eight years to renew their CDL, they will have to go every other year. And that is a like not a huge undertaking, but it gets to be a lot. And especially for somebody in their 70s, and they could have retired years ago. Um, I'm 80% certain that after the 24-25 school year, we'll be losing another driver um, due to retirement as well, because they, you know what I mean, it's already mm -hmm. in their plan. Um, so it's one of those things where, yes, we are for sure losing two for this next school year, which is like huge, but we have three others, like any day they could not come back. And especially, I mean, not that it is going to happen, but you think of age in your seventies, any kind of medical mm -hmm. thing, you know what I mean? Like that would level us. Is there any room in the budget instead of being the top 50% of wages to be the top? Because I mean, there's people change jobs and the big thing is money. Money is what pays the mortgage, keeps the lights on, and that's what ultimately most jobs come down to. I mean, if if, if other benefits aren't working to bring people in, something's I, I get it, it's probably been a hard road for you guys to to just keep keep things going as it is, but there's there's got to be a better way. We've we've been involved in addressing the compensation. Um, I don't I don't know. I mean, when we talk about sustainability, bird is in full effect in multiple ways. Sustainability to what we can accomplish. Sustainability what our budget will sustain. Um, if you watch our board meetings over the last eight years, five years. We are constantly um, using a forecast model to look out two to four years. Kim and I work together on this all the time and we're trying to ensure that we're using your tax dollars as efficiently as we feel we can. Um, one, of, one of the things that has come up is to provide benefits to bus drivers and, and we do not. But I can tell you that fiscally the cost of doing that is um, we wouldn't be able to sustain that right now. But if you can't provide benefits, then add a higher hourly wage to compensate for that. We've been, doing, been, been doing. We we've raised and raised and raised. We were talked about in the committee meetings. You know, a proposal for well, in in years past, every year, but now again for this next year, there's a, a new proposal out. I think we've so. gotten to a point where the. the don't feel a barrier is the dollar. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless we made it, you know, really significant, but right, you know, the numbers, but uh, but sustainability is not yeah. there. Then you can't listen, I, I good dialogue, we respect ideas, concepts, you know, funnel them back in through the administration or through Brandy. If there's creative ideas, we've had a lot of minds looking at this. I mean, at the end of the day, we've we've just got to, we've got to get we've got to get additional drivers, you know. And whether that's right now to eliminate this, um, you know, decision we're going to have to make tonight or the future when there's even less than even less than or less drivers than what we have right now, it's going to be a significant concern. And we do really really appreciate you guys coming in. We. Um, not a decision we want to be talking about tonight. I have one other question. Um, with the transportation meetings, is that something other people uh, can come to for with ideas? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, when are those? So we do post them online when we're going to have them. 
um, 24 hour notice, right? Yeah, because sometimes it's that quick. They're not held regular. No, it's not a regular, no, it's not a regular schedule okay. meeting. But they're, they're posted as, as a normal board meeting would be posted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, they're right here. I just have one other question. When this decision is made, which I think that you guys are all kind of for that, and not in a negative way, but it is kind of a rock and hard place, especially for you guys who will all be the names of like, well, so and so did this, right? <laughs> um, I want to know who is going to help make it easier for us to drop our kids off and pick our kids up. That we're being put in this situation because even like if I pick up my kids early, like I'm there at 2:45 to pick them up for a three o'clock appointment. There's 15 cars onto the road. There are people that are walkers parked by the um, the cemetery that make it hard for you to even get into the school. That like they never even get in line. So like, I wonder yeah. like, what's going to be I part think, of that after discussion. I think there'll have to be. Yes. You know, along with this, what is the impact and what is that going to mm -hmm. if we unfortunately, you know, assuming this goes through this evening and then if we're not able to get any drivers between now and then, what are implications that may result in some of the things yeah. that you're talking that, that about? Is, yeah, is part of my hesitation. If I run from home, I can get my kids on the bus and sure. see you later. And right, you know, that yeah. does cut into but and yeah. it's not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we it's definitely know it's going to make traffic more congested and yeah. it's not going to make things easier. So, yeah, so just some really good thought into that if yeah. that is the place that you were put in. I would yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah, and this is a certainly a painful discussion because I hate the thought of children walking on Coney Island. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you, I hate the thought of it. I I drive from the Abrams area to bring my middle school son to Washington on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and I drive up by. And sometimes it's a decent drive, but sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll say it, sometimes you have some high schoolers that are on your tail a little bit or getting a little crazy because they're running a few minutes late and it's uncomfortable sometimes mm -hmm. so i just i, I want to put it out there that i hate the thought of it mm -hmm. so drop off do we ever think about any more uh in the back of the elementary elementary and then having the parents work on that one-way street that wasn't feasible with um the sewers and everything back there and the weight of the buses and with all that i mean initially it's like more parking and like a change of routine was like put in with a referendum mm -hmm. which was something that was Me. nixed right when it wasn't passed that's right yes so we you know like this we went through thinking of ways to park in the back and do that thing but it's like parking in the back versus the front isn't feasible right was especially it, backing up wasn't one of the line. one of the, mm -hmm. the projects that was eliminated when we had the downsize the referendum mm -hmm. yes. Yes. making okay. changes for yeah yes so brandy's referencing so i'm sure that will be a request yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um i guess we're looking for a we want to move forward on this so inclined. Um, I'll make the motion to increase the radius, radius <laughs> to a two mile, um, two mile radius without transportation. From the new spot or the old? From the, the new newly proposed spot. Yes. Starting, what? starting in yes. the, the new school year, 2024-25 school year. Might it encourage some people that are on the fence if that motion included, unless we recruit. Yes, un yes, unless we recruit. How many? Well, I mean, I guess this doesn't need to be part of the specific motion. Ad right. Ad it adequate have to be adequate right drivers to maintain. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, this has got to be an eye-opening moment for the. I mean, just let's. I, I remember one of my first meetings when we were over in the PAC, at, and mm -hmm. I was maybe my second or third meeting, and I made a plea, and that was three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to make a plea again. 
We don't want to do this. So I will second, Sarah. Motion by Sarah, second by Carrie. Any other discussion? I know a lot of a lot of moms work, uh, but uh, I can remember the ads. I think it was Lamers, either Lamers or Cobos, and the ads on TV. Uh, women that they were recruiting, saying, "You know, bring your kids to work with you." Mm -hmm. So that might be something for some people to consider. Yeah. We we need them. That's why I started oh, driving. That. That's okay. why I started. Well, maybe we need to promote that more. For the or the uh, older gentleman that says there's only so much time a guy can go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We joke, but it's not a joking matter. Yeah. We all realize that. So thank you for coming in, though, um, everybody. Yes, yeah. we appreciate. It. So any other feedback, please, you know, get it to us, and and we will certainly, if you have ideas that we haven't discussed or you feel that you have something, we are always open to suggestions. Absolutely. With that. Uh, again, motion by Sarah, second by Carrie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, next up, 2024-2025 uh, base wage. So members of the Compensation Committee of the Board met with the Ocala Falls United Association and First off, there was the sharing of proposals, and then the committee and the United Association met in order to um, better understand each other's proposal. And the outcome of that is a document that is the Oconnell United Association certification, and it's signed by Val Nichols, the OFUA president, and it's essentially stating that we reached consensus regarding total base wage uh, increase of 4.05%. Um, we're asking the board to consider ratification of that. I move that we ratify the agreement with the O'Connell Falls United Association as presented. Second. Motion by Ken, second by Chad. Um, and that was for both certified as well as support staff. No. So the groups are not. So the initial conversation was with certified staff. We're asking the board to consider that same 4.05 percent for the support staff members. Yeah. So my question that is, didn't is that, that did require a, that doesn't require the okay. okay. I would add okay. that to my motion. Okay. okay. All right, Chad, are you comfortable with that? Yep. Okay. All right. Any other? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. And Debbie, on that, is there two six, two up here that I'll have to sign, or just one? Just, just one. Okay. The one without the punch holes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, resignation and retirement requests. We're asking the board to consider accepting the retirement from two of our prescribers, um, Mr. Steve Rude. No motion. Not accepted. Twenty-one years of service, and this is Debbie Johnson with five years of service. Um, and I'd ask everybody, please join me in thanking them yes. um, for their yeah. support. I'll make that motion. Motion by Sarah. I'll second. Second by Emily. I will say how it was really nice in one of the resignations, just how um, they spoke about the support that they've mm -hmm. been receiving from administration, from Brandy, from um, principals, vice principals. Um, I think that really is telling that, you know, I'm not, I'm not leaving because the kids are, you know, acting up. I feel very, very supported. And I think that, um, you know, can really speak to just the longevity of the bus drivers that we do that we do have. It's really telling. So thank you to the administration um, and to the um, administrators at the other school, um, all the schools for just continuing to support our bus drivers. I think that's a huge help. So thank, you. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, contract approvals. 
could really do it. Yeah, it's the same <laughs> yeah. Asking the board to consider approving a contract for Ms. Beth Lindemeyer. Um, she be a district DL teacher at Washington Middle School. Um, this is a position that was actually approved in the budget two years ago. We were unable to fill it last year. So we're extremely excited. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Beth, join us. Yes. So I'm hopeful that you'll consider taking to ratify that contract. That's um, filling a huge need. Yes. Motion, um, motion by Chad first, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Second by Sarah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Welcome to the team, Beth. Uh, policy revisions. We can have a member of our policy committee walk our board through um, the information on the uh, most of the day policy revision 31, 33-1. Yeah, I will uh, go ahead and we'll kind of brief the board on the conversations um, that we have with the policies. Um, so, um, Ken and Carrie and I reviewed it and kind of came to the same conclusion, uh, nothing earth sh shattering within it, but I'll give you some bullet points just to kind of chew on uh, so we can discuss it. Um, so just kind of a reminder that there could be the same policy revisions for a couple employee groups, for example, 3,000 certified groups and 4,000 support group could basically be the same thing. So don't get kind of too tied up in that. Um, policy 33-1 with the technical updates. Um, really, there wasn't anything major for discussion in these eight policies. Just again, just tough, uh, technical verbiage, just kind of cleaning some things up. So nothing is really, you know, spoke to us out loud and said, oh, we really need to come right. to you with that. Mm -hmm. um, the 33-1 update, so uh, policy 34-31 and 44-31 employee leads. Um, I think the biggest topic around this was the option regarding military leave. Um, so we as a just district need to decide if a staff member, um, if they're sent to active duty for an, uh, an extended period of time, uh, would we provide paid leave while on active duty? Um, so I think this was an important one for us to uh, kind of look at. Um, the committee, the three of us, we are recommending that we would compensate them the difference between what the military pay is and their current salary of the district. Um, in short, uh, we would make them whole. Um, the consensus was anyone serving our country and willing to go do that. Um, I think it is the least that we can do to make sure that they're rightfully compensated. And their families don't exactly don't feel suffer the burden of mm -hmm. what they're doing for our country. Mm -hmm. I think that policy also did not speak to something about uh, other reasons for, I mean, uh, the uh, people that, uh, that take unpaid leave uh, for, for various reasons all have to be treated equitably are the same so if we give at least for something else oh yeah. if yeah. they have to leave for something else yeah maybe? they're treated the same you know if somebody has to go like to jury duty or something takes the jury duty pay we would make up the difference under our suggestion same as vets or same as the military uh, which we do for our which we do yeah. already mm -hmm. which we do already yeah so, mm -hmm. so we're following, we're already yeah. following that mm -hmm. yes. okay. um so that was i think that was important to uh the the committee on that one uh 6320 under purchasing uh currently uh we would have to complete um rfp or a request for purchase for anything over fifty thousand uh, dollars which at time can be kind of nimble and take a longer amount of time to do so um so we're you know, recommending we increase it from fifty to seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. We would still get multiple quotes, so that process does not change, um, and um, that way we'd be able to react quicker uh, with that uh, small increase from fifty to seventy-five. Um, Sixty-three twenty-five. The procurement uh, federal grants. Uh, this has been revised to update the federal procurement requirements for projects that involve federal grant funds. Uh, including provisions of prevailing wages according to uh, the Davis-Bacon Act. Uh, the bid requirement 
Uh, it's been raised from 150,000 to 250 uh, in the federal acquisition uh, regulations or the FAR. Uh, so that's just something to note there. Uh, the key is federal funding and federal grants. Uh, it's primarily for food service. So mm -hmm. just to kind of give you that background. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a more here, 6610 Student Activity Fund. Uh, we're just going to rescind this policy because it's going to be replaced with uh, 6611. Mm -hmm. And 6611 is the district supported sponsored student activity accounts. So the two highlights in here is this new policy provides clearer expectations on student activity accounts. Um, so Kim is currently working with each building and their staff to have a better accountability on funds that are collected on behalf of student groups. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we kind of ran into that one not too long ago. So um, those are a uh, couple things we just want to point out to the board. Um, you know, as in the past, you know, we could, you know, treat this as a first reading or if we get approval from more motion, uh, we could approve this as a first and second reading. So was I, have, the, I guess it was a consensus of the committee to recommend it as a first and uh, second? Yes, yes, it was. Yeah. Um, I, there was nothing really earth shattering within the recommended changes from the old that we felt it was pretty straightforward. Okay. But we just really want to, you know, point out about the military part to the board. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Motion would be asking. First and second. Second. Thank you. Thank you. On both updated and the other one. Technical update. Yes. Technical for the technical update and the technical correction. Yeah. Second. Chad. Second, but who was that? Emily. 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 Yeah. The other thing I was gonna open up for discussion. The other thing I was going to add is if you think about how long that $50,000 threshold was the one in, put in place. If you look at inflation, like that, like 75 probably like has less than the original yeah. 50 was probably yeah. put in. So yeah. I don't know. That makes, makes sense. Thank you guys for going over that. Yep, absolutely. All right. All Aye. Right. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Closed session. Pull my eyeball. Chad said he's not reading. I'm not doing that anymore. Brian? All right. A board will consider convening in a closed sex, uh, session pursuant to Wisconsin statute section 19.851F to consider financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personal problems or the investigation of charges against specific persons, which, if discussed in public, would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. Specifically, the board will to discuss a student conduct investigation in Wisconsin Statute Section 19.851C to consider the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the board has jurisdiction. Specifically, to discuss individual staff compensation. Motion by Brian. We have a second. Second. Second, second. second. second by Chad. Uh, roll call, please. Hill. Yes. Trudell. Yes. Carter. Yes. Hurley. Yes. Palmer. Yes. Schindel. Yes. Carter Brett. Yes. Carried. We are in closed session. 59. No, 49. 40. Oh, come on. <laughs>